So the next time you're trying to talk to somebody about cosmology and they think you're crazy for suggesting that outer space is actually an integral part of a transhumanist quest for immortality, you might want to suggest they just go listen to Michio Kaku talking about all of it in a recent podcast he did on the future of humans, aliens, space travel, and physics. Here's some of my favorite excerpts from it. Not only are we going to merge with our technology, we'll also digitize our personality, our memories, our feelings. You realize that during the Middle Ages, there was something called dualism. Dualism meant that the soul was separate from the body. When the body died, the soul went to heaven. That's dualism. Then in the 20th century, neuroscience came in and said, bah, humbug. Every time we look at the brain, it's us neurons. That's it, folks. Period. End of story. Bunch of neurons firing. Now we're going back to dualism. Now we realize that we can digitize human memories, feelings, sensations, and create a digital copy of ourselves. And that's called the Connectome Project. Billions of dollars are now being spent to do not just the genome project of sequencing the genes of our body, but the Connectome Project which is to map the entire connections of the human brain. And even before then, already in Silicon Valley, today, at this very moment, you can contact Silicon Valley companies that are willing to digitize your relatives. (laughs) Because some people want to talk to their parents. There are unresolved issues with their parents. And one day, yes, firms will digitize people and you'll be able to talk to them a reasonable facsimile. We leave a digital trail. And so I think that we are going to digitize ourselves and give us digital immortality. Hmm. We'll not only have biologic genetic immortality of some sort, but also digital immortality. And what are we going to do with it? I think we should send it into outer space. If you digitize the human brain and put it on a laser beam and shoot it to the moon, you're on the moon in one second. Shoot it to Mars, you're on Mars in 20 minutes. Shoot it to Pluto, you're on Pluto in eight hours. Think about it for a moment. You can have breakfast in New York and for a morning snack, vacation on the moon, then zap your way to Mars by noontime, journey to the asteroid belt in the afternoon, and then come back for dinner in New York at night. (laughs) All in a day's work at the speed of light. Now, this means that You don't need booster rockets. You don't need weightlessness problems. You don't need to worry about meteorites. And what's on the moon? On the moon, there is a mainframe that downloads your laser beams information. And where does it download the information into? An avatar. (laughs) And what does that avatar look like? Anything you want. Think about it for a moment. You could be Superman, Superwoman on the moon, on Mars traveling throughout the universe at the speed of light, downloading your personality into any vehicle you want. Now, let me stick my neck out. So far, everything I've been saying is well within the laws of physics. Well within the laws of physics. Now, let me go outside the laws of physics again. Here we go. (laughs) I think this already exists. I think outside the Earth, there could be a super highway, a laser highway of laser porting with billions of souls of aliens zapping their way across the galaxy. Now, let me ask you a question. Are we smart enough to determine whether such a thing exists or not? No, this could exist right outside the orbit of the planet Earth. And we're too stupid in our technology to even prove it or disprove it. We would need the aliens on this laser superhighway to help us out. (laughs) <laughs> to, to, to send us a uh, human interpretable signal. I mean, it ultimately boils down to the language of communication, but that's an exciting possibility that actually the sky is filled <laughs> with the aliens. aliens. could already be here, and we're just <laughs> so oblivious that we're too stupid to know it. See, they don't have to be in alien form with, with uh, little green men. They can be in any form they want, in an avatar of their creation. Well, in fact, they could very well be 
They didn't uh, even look like us. Exactly. We'd never but, know. Let me ask you, if you yourself could become immortal, would you? Damn straight. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think about it for a while because, of course, it, determ- it depends on how you become immortal. You know, there's a famous myth of Tithonus. It turns out that years ago the, in the Greeks' uh, mythology, there was the saga of Tithonus and Aurora. Yeah. Aurora was the goddess of the dawn. And she fell in love with a mortal, a human called Tithonus. And so Aurora begged, begged Zeus to grant her the the gift of immortality to give to her lover. So Zeus took pity on Aurora and made Tithonus immortal. But you see, Aurora made a mistake, a huge mistake. She asked for immortality, but she forgot to ask for eternal youth. So poor Tithonus got older and older and older every year, decrepit, a bag of bones, but he could never die, never die. Quality of life is important. (laughs) So I think immortality is a great idea as long as you also have immortal youth as well. Now I personally believe, and I cannot prove this, but I personally believe that our grandkids may have the option of reaching the age of 30 and then stopping. They may like being age 30 because you have wisdom, you have all the benefits of age and maturity, and you still live forever with a healthy body. Our descendants may like being 30 for several centuries. Do you yourself, I mean, there's so much excitement and passion in the way you talk about physics and the way you talk about technology in the future. Do you yourself meditate on your own mortality? Do you think about this clock that's ticking? Well, I try not to because it then begins to affect your behavior. You begin to alter your behavior to to match your expectation of Mm. of when you're going to die. When I interview scientists Mm. on radio, I often ask them, what made the difference? How old were you? What changed your life? And they always say more or less the same thing. No, these are Nobel Prize winners, directors of major laboratories, very distinguished scientists. They always say, when I was 10, when I was 10, something happened. It was a visit to the planetarium. It was a telescope. For Steven Weinberg, winner of the Nobel Prize, it was the chemistry kit. For Heinz Pagels, it was a visit to the planetarium. For Isidore Rabi, it was a, a book about the planets. For Albert Einstein, it was a compass. Something happened which gives them this existential shock. Because you see, before the age of 10, everything is mommy and daddy, mommy and dad. That's your universe, mommy and daddy. Around the age of 10, you begin to wonder, what's beyond mommy and daddy? And that's when you have this epiphany, when you realize, oh my God, there's a universe out there a universe of discovery. That sensation stays with you for the rest of your life. You still remember that shock that you felt gazing at the universe. So even in old age, I've noticed that these scientists, when they sit back, they still remember. They still remember that flush that flush of excitement they felt with that first telescope. That first moment when they encountered the universe. That keeps them going. That keeps them going. 